individual liberties, drugs, the prison system, which is you know, loaded with nonviolent drug offenders that should have gotten no harsher a sentence than a high five. Yeah, uh, I'm that guy. Doug Stanhope is a beloved comedian known for his caustic, dark, honest humor. If there were no afterlife, how could my mother have bought me and my friends so many nice things from the Sky Mall catalog on her credit card four days after she passed from this earth? His new book, Digging Up Mother, is a tribute to his late mom, Bonnie. And in true Stanhope style, it's a bizarre and charming mixture of scummy debauchery, relentless self-criticism, biting social commentary, and, of course, straight-up comedy. Stanhope sat down with us to discuss comedy, what Alcoholics Anonymous taught him about stand-up, his time dabbling in libertarian presidential politics, and how his mother, for better or worse, shaped him into the man he is today. Let me start by saying that Reason Magazine is the only magazine that I subscribe to and actually pay the bill. Wow. I have other ones like The Economist, I'll uh, bill me later and I'd never pay it. Reason I actually pay the bill. Well, thank you for keeping up with that payment. And when I'm done, I always leave them in the uh, pocket in the airplane uh -huh. so other people get the message. Your memoir is this insane tale of debauchery, drugs, comedy, and love. And the central character is your mother, uh, right. Bonnie. She was a, an alcoholic, uh, suffered from depression, was a truck driver, a bartender, and then an actress, a failed comedian for a minute, which I had to watch, and it was really painful. Pillhead, you know, Vicodin addict, uh, suicidal, funny. She was a caretaker who abused her patients. <laughs> She was evil, yet uh, all heart. You seem to both have a love of, of comedy. Yeah. Whereas y your dad is portrayed as this like really nice and pleasant guy who, who doesn't really get the joke, but he you and your yeah. mom are like on this weird level. Could you talk about you know, comedy and what Even it Even early to you? on, she was, you know, she was dragging us to mm -hmm. Richard Pryor when he had his movie in theaters, his live stand-up movie, and we're 10 years old, and she's dragging us to stuff like that. And, leaving Hustler magazine around so, and I'd read all the truly tasteless jokes, the cartoons and the, yeah, I, I developed a, a very adult sense of humor way too early to be bringing it to the schoolyard. There's an example in your book of one of your homework assignments. It was one of those things where you like have to write a sentence with the vocabulary word. Right. Uh, I was wondering if you might read a couple of those <laughs> sure. for us. And, and Absolutely. What, about what age were you here? This I, I would have been around 11. Okay. This type of humor is what got me sent to uh, psychologists. He is uh, the most skillful hitman in Chicago. They all said he was the worst aim until they saw his flaming arrow rip between the man's eyes. Third sentence. It was the most pleasant of the protesters who were slain by National Guard machine gun fire. And finally, it was easier to crunch the baby's head in the vice. So yeah, you turn in homework like that when you're 11, they're not thinking class clown. Right. They're thinking a troubled kid. Right. If, current day, they'd think school shooter. And the, the teachers sent you to for psychological counseling and, and yeah, thought that this was like a serious problem. Yeah, a battery problem. of tests and Rorschach exams, and I had to draw a picture of my family. So I had my stepfather banging my mother doggy style. My brother was uh, uh, killing a cat with a knife and I was hanging myself. Because I thought that was funny. And I just had a dark sense of humor, which just speeded up the cycle. He needs to go to counseling. There's something wrong with this kid. Yeah, I had a dark sense of humor, but it was just jokes. And so they were freaking out. How did your mother react? My mother, that was the kind of shit we'd talk about around the dinner table. Mm -hmm. That She just kind of ignored it. Uh, and would defend me when she had to. Uh, we would go to the school psychologist, the counselor, and we'd 
you know, do the same thing we did to her in grocery stores where we'd go, oh, mama, are we going to have to have our beatings today? And the guy would just almost drop his clipboard and go, what's this about beatings? And yeah. she'd have to explain, this is just our sense of humor. And so, I mean, this is like the uh, kind of early forming of a, of a comedian's mind, but the school is medicalizing it as something that needs to be treated and there's something wrong with you. How many brilliant minds that are thinking outside the box, I hate the expression, but just have different personalities are being crushed by the school system that says, no, you, you just follow the rules and don't step out of line. Benjamin Franklin would have been a, put under a 72 hour watch you know, as a danger to himself and others flying a, a kite in a rainstorm. What's a kid suicidal? He's got a key on a kite in a lightning storm. There's this trend now in higher education. A lot of comedians have been talking about they won't perform on college campuses because the kids are also like Oh, the kids will sit there with a blank index card waiting for you to say the wrong thing so they can make a protest sign. Do you perform on college Gen campuses? No, I, 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 half a dozen colleges back years ago made the mistake of booking me after a NACA convention. Yeah. And uh, I'm sure every single one of those student activity directors was fired for having me on the stage. Word got out, no more stand no. on campus. No, never again. Nor would I want to. You don't want to perform in that environment. The book opens with uh, the death of your mother, which yeah. was a kind of assisted suicide Assi cocktail party. Could you talk Pseudo about Pseudo assisted. For legal reasons, okay. yeah. I'll be making the cocktails. I don't know how many morphine pills you're taking. I turn a blind eye. But yeah, we made it into a, a cocktail party slash roast because uh, she did have a dark sense of humor right up until the end. And and it was a, it was a fantastic way to go. I, I wish Comedy Central would pick that up for, for their roasts and yeah. do, doing it to someone on their deathbed because that's the way I'd want to go. It's such a contentious issue now. Like a lot of states are changing this issue. It was just uh, changed here in California. It's now allowed. It's, yeah, it's sad that you have to go to s someplace as depressing as Oregon to kill yourself. You should be able to do it in a, a sunnier place. Uh, but yeah, I think the tide is turning. We had to like just talk in, in you know, mumbo jumbo. Well, if someone were to kill themselves, how much of this dosage would they need? And like, not I'm going to kill myself because she knows I can't know, even though I know. Right. It seems like the hospice workers are kind of like given a little like wink, wink, and this is how yeah. you would theoretically do this sort yeah, of thing. Yeah. Oh, you want? Uh, do you want three weeks worth now? All right, gotcha. In case you want to you know, make your own choice, but there's people who don't have a choice. You got people with locked-in syndrome. How's Stephen Hawking going to kill himself if he wanted to? You can't blink yourself to death on a screen. So your mom had a lot of problems with alcohol, um, and she would take you along with her to AA meetings. Yeah, yeah. Um, she sobered up when I was around seven years old. So I basically grew up in AA. How did that experience, going to AA meetings as a child, uh, shape well, your it, view of the world. If you've never been to an AA meeting, it's almost like they're advertising alcohol when they speak because they you know, make all these stories grandiose. They yeah. build them up and they're laughing during them. And, and then I, you know, I got stabbed and then I woke up in a, you know, another town and I didn't have my pants on and everyone's laughing and they sum it up with some moral and thank God for the program, I don't have fun like that anymore. <laughs> so you're listening to this and it's very adult in content. Yeah. They don't censor their language and you're 12 years old in the back of the room. I'm laughing my balls off. And uh, I, I'm, I'm sure a lot of just the storytelling uh, in AA, I'm sure was had to be of some influence to me, making light of the most dire situations in life. And that's what I gravitate towards in my act. As a treatment organization, you've actually been like, kind of critical of AA. I think it's that? five of the 12 steps are about you turning your life over to God. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter. Yeah, you know, what God it is. You, you, they say, oh, a doorknob can be your God as long as you're turning your life and your will over to. Like, first of all, I, I'm, I'm a drunk. This is probably not the best time for me to be creating my own omnipotent deity. <laughs> Maybe I should have a more structured God. It, it's just silly. Uh -huh. If you went to uh, an oncologist and said, hey, what's this lump? And uh, he told you to just pray and have faith. <laughs> 
you'd go, oh, I'm screwed. <laughs> Everyone uh, in the book is fairly nomadic and you kind of just go places because you think it would be funny to live in Idaho or something Yes, like that. I, I've always been very impulsive. I've yeah. planned very little. So, and, and now the place you've landed in is uh, Bisbee, Arizona, yeah. which is a kind of small border town in Arizona. Yeah. Why Bisbee? Why are you there? It's just a town I, I fell in love with when I lived in LA and I'd drive out to go on the road. Had a couple of days to kill between gigs in Phoenix and El Paso, so I just took back roads and you go through this tunnel and you're like, what the hell is this town? It's an old mining town, but it's artists took it over in the 70s when the mine shut and it's gorgeous. It's perfect. I hate traffic. I don't like people much. And it's right out on the Mexican border. So I'm right by the fire exit. When Trump gets elected, <laughs> get out before they build that wall. You've had some involvement in the mayoral race there in Bisbee. Could you tell me a little bit about that? We have two friends. They're, they're like 40-year-old Beavis and Butthead friends that just sit around my house all the time and get high and watch The Price is Right. And we thought it'd be funny to run, run them both, run, run them against each other and ignore all the legitimate candidates. I don't know if they'll get enough signatures to actually get on the ballot, but in the meantime, we're making the townsfolk sweat that <laughs> these guys are actually running. You actually sort of ran for president at one point under for yeah, the Libertarian Party? Yeah, I thought that would party. be funny in uh, yeah. 08, and I, I think I lasted about a month. And once it got into the paperwork, and oh, if you're doing this legit, you know, I can't mention this on stage without the money I make from the gig being considered campaign contributions. Oh. And like, oh. I, there's way too many rules and I screw up way too many times in a day to be facing six figure fines for not dotting an I, yeah. crossing a T. Have you been following any of the libertarian Oh yeah, politics? no, I follow Gary Johnson. I'm a huge supporter of Gary and uh, want to get him on my podcast, but uh, I live too far away. That guy's fantastic. Hopefully the Trump uh, you know, rats fleeing the Republican Party will actually give the, the LP a boost. What do you like about Gary Johnson's message? I don't know shit about uh, the economic side of the Libertarian Party. One of the reasons I bowed out, I guess I'm never going to learn this, but just uh, individual liberties, drugs, the prison system, which is you know, loaded with nonviolent drug offenders that should have gotten no harsher a sentence than a high five for selling drugs. You mentioned Trump. Do you, what, is Hillary not a viable alternative? I'd rather have, at this age, being almost 50 and having no kids and no care about the future and no hot prospects for living a long life, Trump, I'd take over Hillary just for the entertainment value. They're just entertainment to me. It's yeah. no different than professional sports. No president in my entire lifetime has affected me personally on any you know, direct level that I could point to. So yeah, it's a guy you have to watch on, or a lady you have to watch on CNN, and she's a, a terrible actress. Walking round my chair, looking at the moving spoon, trying jump money.